are plenty of logistics data points that plenty of folks in this industry love to stress over and analyze and create reports about, but there are few data points that remain around freight marketing research. Well, in this episode, I'm going to be changing that by diving deep into the top 20 carriers or some of the top 20 carriers in the United States and how they are approaching digital marketing and social strategy. Welcome into a live episode of Cyberly. I am your host, Blythe Brumleave. And on the show, we talk about B2B marketing, the attention economy, and how it all fits into the world of logistics. And I've kind of missed saying that because this is officially our first live show in uh, about two months since right before uh, the Freight Waves Now conference. That was back in early May. I did a bunch of conference tours, 30 com- or not 30 conferences, three conferences in 30 days. So that was the content that we have been playing on every Thursday. So this is the first official show back live. I'm pretty pumped to be here. A little, little nervous, but we have a good show planned for you today. And like I said, that first topic is going to be about what can we learn from the top 20 carriers or some of the top 20 carriers in the United States. I took this list from the FreightWaves top 500 carriers in the United States. So we're going to go through what some of the digital marketing strategies that a lot of these companies are using in their digital marketing and also their social media. Then later on in the show, we are going to talk to Gabe from Rocket Shipping. He's going to talk LTL crappy TMS systems and TikTok content. So we can't have a live cyberly show without talking about TikTok content. But before we get into our first topic, we have a first for the cyberly show, first live cyberly show. You might have heard this new sponsor information on last week's show, but this is the first time I get to talk about it live. Pretty pumped that you know we have this show for about uh, a year and a few months now. So this is the first official cyberly sponsor, which is we're kind of growing up here. But the Moon Air Group is a leading recruiting firm specializing in the logistics and technology fields. Whether you're looking for a new job in the industry or you're looking to hire top tier talent, the Moon Air Group has the network strength to meet your needs. Learn more at moonairgroup.com. We have a link to them in the show notes. And Wasim, who is one of the company founders, he's actually going to be a guest on next week's Cyberly. So we're going to dive into some job market reports and all of the interesting job movements that are going on around the country ever since we've covered the great resignation and how workforce has been shifting. So excited for that interview on next week. But first, let's get into this week's topic. And that's how the top carriers are in the US are treating digital marketing. And I mentioned earlier that I have gone to several conferences, three conferences in the span of 30 days. But what going to those conferences allows me to do is I can I can be able to talk to a lot of people firsthand and find out the systems and processes that they're using. You've heard a lot of those on, on previous Cyberly episodes. But then I was also able to look over with those pre-recorded interviews being played over the last couple of months. It also gave me a chance to have a break, a little bit of a break to get some business planning done, some budgeting done. But then also to get sort of an eagle eye view of what type of content that you guys like seeing the most from Cyberly. So I looked at the social media clips. I looked at the different segments that we've published, um, the different episodes that we've published. And you guys really love data. So I'm going to lean into more of the data and storytelling side of things and how other freight companies are approaching all of these different digital media strategies that are coming up. And first up, I want to talk about how the carriers are approaching digital media strategy. And so with this study, what I looked at is I took that FreightWaves top 500 carrier list. I took the top 12, I will say the top 12, because the first two, one and two, they are UPS and FedEx. That's not necessarily the right market that I, when I want to do this study of what tools that, you know, real, I don't say real trucking companies, but you know what I mean when I say the actual semi-truck companies, first mile and middle mile, how are they approaching digital media strategy? So I took those first 12, in reality, it's the first 10 of the actual trucking companies, excluding FedEx and UPS. Then of that 500 list, I took the bottom 10. So these companies are still, even though they're in the bottom part of the 500, they're still massively huge companies that are ranking on these different lists. So how are they approaching it? What are those nuances? What are those differences? And, and, and how they're approaching their digital strategies? Because 90% of the US carriers in this country have seven trucks or less. So what can these small business owners that are wearing a ton of hats, 
what can they learn and what can we learn? What strategies are they at the top companies that are using that the little guys can take advantage of? So uh, some fun stats and key takeaways that I wanted to jump into is that the first one that I noticed is that make the website a central place for employees, customers, and prospects. Nine companies out of these 20 had custom built websites. 10 of them use WordPress and one of them used Webflow. So a lot of the the top 10 of what I was referring to with the top 10 carriers in the US, not UPS, not FedEx, remember that. So nine of them had a custom built solution. One of them was using WordPress. The rest of those websites, all of them were all using WordPress with the exception of one, which is using a company called Webflow. Um, So you might hear a lot of advertisements, a lot, especially on podcasts and YouTube about using Squarespace or Wix. I don't think that's the best strategy for a lot of folks in the freight industry because it's difficult to grow and scale and integrate different technologies into those platforms than it is for WordPress. WordPress is the most cost-effective solution. It is the most affordable solution. It allows you to grow as your company grows. You can build on that platform for as long as you want. It's somewhat independent depending on the integrations that you have into your website. And so you can have this ability to scale as your company scales. So this is the big reason why a lot of these companies are the majority of the web is powered by WordPress. So that was one big takeaway. Another thing that was really sort of common, especially among the top 10, is that these companies had a separate website just for driver recruiting. Now, some of that driver recruiting was done, uh, they have other positions available. So me- mechanical positions, um, you know, staffing positions, th- things like that. So they had a separate complete website just for recruiting drivers. And that was one big thing that stood out to me. But one company that was on this list that didn't have a separate website, because this that can kind of be hit or miss. If you have a separate website for just your drivers, then you, you really have to be hone in on the strategy of what you're going after when you have the big corporate website, but then you want to send traffic away to specific recruiting efforts. So there's essentially two different markets that these, these top companies are going after with their website branding. So the overwhelming majority of them had separate websites at the top 10. The bottom 10 of this list that I'm talking about, they, 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 all of their uh, content was all built into one website. So they had one home for all their drivers and customers and employees to come and see. One really great example was Werner. So we have a, an image of their website. I thought they had a really great website design, by the way, very simplistic to the point. Um, their navigation was really crisp and clear. You have a, a, a clear goal when you arrive on their website of what they want the user to do, which is their quote unquote ROI. So they had a clear goal of this. Another great design website because Werner is technically in the bottom 10 of the top 500. They're a huge company, great company. Um, but then another sort of great company, big company is Landstar. And Landstar had a beautiful site design too. And when I say that custom photography goes a long way when it comes to helping your website stand out, this is exactly what I mean. It's a bright photo of one of the Landstar trucks. It is. It catches the eye. And then there is one CTA button that your eye is drawn to. And it says, why Landstar? And so I thought that that was another really just sort of a highlight of a beautiful design of what can take place and how you can highlight your company. Because the primary goal of any website, I was told this years ago, the primary goal of any company website is to reduce the amount of phone calls that are sent to your accounting team and sent to your brokerage team. If you can answer some of these questions, if you can document some of these processes and add them to your website, you're reducing the amount of phone calls that your staff gets because then your staff has more time to work on things that are more revenue producing. So another really great example of reducing the phone calls, the unnecessary phone calls that you're getting to your company. This is a great example from Ross Express. It's not the most modern looking website, but it gets the job done because all of these documents, you know, a a bill of lading, credit application, certificate of insurance, all of your carrier paperwork, um, holiday schedule, you know, uh, permits, operating authority, all of those documents that you're brokerage team or your account, the accounting team constantly needs, and a lot of that paperwork is missing, they list it right on their website under a resources page. So this is the, this is an exhibit A of how you can use your company or use your company website as a resource in order to help other people 
get their job done because they don't have to answer the phone call to send over, you know, a, a credit application for a new customer. They can focus on the customer instead and just send over that information that they know they're going to need that and they know accounting is going to bug them for. So put this information right on your website. You don't have to make it public. You can make it a private link that just your your staff keeps on keeps bookmarked on their desktop and then they can use that to send it out as they get new customers, as they get new carrier relationships, all that good stuff. So making a a section of your website completely devoted to just the paperwork portion of things can help really hone down or really tone down a lot of those unnecessary phone calls that your staff may be receiving. Another goal of a website is to entice users to submit a quote. Now, I'm kind of, I, I, I'm not the biggest fan of having folks submit a quote on a website because I just don't think that shippers are actively out here looking for people to, or looking for companies in order to submit a quote on. You have carriers and you have 3PLs beating down the doors, trying to get shippers and, or trying to haul the freight of these shippers. So they're not actively going to go out at least not all of them are going to actively go out and request a quote on your website. But if they do, they're more likely to do it if you are niche based. And AFC Transport does this the best because they're showcasing the specific industries that they cover. If you're looking at the screen right now, you can see that they have six really nice looking pictures. One of them says steel, one of construction, one manufacturing, one heavy machinery. You get the gist of it. So they have those six boxes where they showcase what they're specialty is, what their niche is. If I'm a shipper and I see that, I'm much more likely to submit a quote to this company because I know that they are experienced in hauling the freight that I need hauled. So that is another really great example. I would also add that for SEO benefits and for additional benefits, I would actually create a page for each one of those images. And I would have the user go directly to that page because then that, that way from a I don't want to say from a tracking standpoint, but from an analytics standpoint is probably, I guess, the more PC way of saying it. From an analytics standpoint, then you can also see that path that the, the visitor is taking and what pages are interesting them the most. You can also put another quote form on that page, maybe a steel page, maybe a construction page, and you can list the nuances of the things that that potential shipper might be worried about or might not know about when they're getting their when they're doing the bid process or when they're trying to get folks to bid on their freight. And so that's another little note that I thought that AC AFC Transport did a really good job at. If you're going to put the request for quote on your website, make sure that it's enticing for the users because it's not going to be a slam dunk for a lot of these shippers to just magically arrive on your website and magically submit a quote. That's not what websites are for. They're meant to close the deal. Your brand awareness, your marketing, your social media strategy is which we'll get to in just a second, that's the part where you want to create that brand awareness that makes people aware of your company and then you send them to your website. And that visitor path, that visitor journey is hopefully as simplified and as niche as possible. Another point I wanted to make was the use of job boards. Overwhelmingly, all of the websites that I, I looked at, they all had their own job board, which was a searchable sort of blog post listing of available jobs. And then they had a link for that user, for that potential prospect in order to apply to become a driver. This can be used for employees. It can be used for other prospects of who you're trying to recruit. But mainly because this is carrier list, most of these job boards were recruiting drivers. Now, one thing I did want to note is that the overwhelming majority of these companies that had a job board, they were sending their traffic to a third party. And what happens when you send that traffic to a third party is that with increasing privacy concerns, you're going to have a much more difficult time of advertising and recruiting in the future using Facebook, using social media ads, Instagram, um, all of these different advertising platforms if you don't have access to your own first party data. That's why it's so important that even if you use third party tools for your applications or you, you have a third party relationship with like a 10 street, for example, if you're sending your application there. It makes the application process easier for the driver, but you're also losing that first party data to begin with, because a lot of times these applications are very long. And so things happen when folks are filling them out. And I know that a lot of these applications make it super easy to just sort of autofill a lot of this information, but a lot of it is still a very manual process. People get distracted, people go and do other things. And so what you have as a situation is that you have all of these visitors coming to your site and then they leave and they give their personal information to a third party and they're not giving it to you first. So 
if I were you, I will go in. I, I'm actually going to go in deeper on a future topic on this show of how we can approach this in an affordable way. But what you want to do is you want to set up maybe a mini application, a mini form on your website. So then that way the, uh, the real application won't appear until they filled out just that little bit of information. That little bit of information will help you tenfold in the years to come as these greater privacy regulations are being brought down because the the, the hammer is already kind of dropped on a lot of privacy regulations, but it's going to drop even more, especially over the next couple of years. Google is building for it. Apple is building for it. It's a really big part of their marketing campaign. So if you're not collecting first party data on your website, you need to start coming up with a plan to do so immediately. Another takeaway that I wanted to mention is to update your social media icons on your website. I was on Freight Waves Now yesterday, and I said the top 12 carriers in the U.S. did not have a TikTok account. And the reason I said this is because they didn't have it listed on their website. But I did manual searches just to sort of Google fact check myself. So I did manual checks for the majority of or all of the list of the 20 different companies that I profiled and that I did research on. The overwhelming majority of them did not have a TikTok account and none of them had it listed on their website that they did have a TikTok account. Only three, three of these companies in the in 20 carriers in the US where drivers are the most active, which is on TikTok, they don't have a TikTok presence at whatsoever. And they don't have, if they do have a presence on there, they don't have the icon, just a simple icon and a link to your TikTok account right on your website. I, that's a little mind numbing, um, but shout out to JB Hunt, Night Transport and AFC Transport for having a TikTok account. It's going to prove super valuable in order to recruit drivers in really right now and in the very near future is the top social media app um, for quite some time now. And it's going to become increasingly important if you're, you're going to be making content on any social media platform. And speaking of social, I also want to make the note of have fun with your content because a lot of the, the social media that I see, not necessarily re referring to this list, but a lot of the social media that I see is kind of boring and just, especially the blogs and it's just really geared towards more like an SEO audience. The companies that have fun with their social media, let, let's throw up the, the night transportation um, graphic up on the screen because they have a lot of fun with their content. One of the, the promos that they have going out is, uh, you know, uh, it was a Tiger King, the Netflix documentary that went wild during COVID. They have a tire king that is on their account and they're making parody content around it they're they're talking about uh, road safety and road checks and you know tips for getting a cdl and all that good stuff night transportation is doing a fabulous job at their tiktok strategy so that's a really good example of just having fun with your content and so as i kind of wrap up this discussion i'm sure a lot of you are like well how can i actually use this information i'm a one person team i'm wearing a ton of hats how can I use this info? And a few takeaway tips that I, that I want to share with you before we get into our interview with Gabe. And the first one is make sure you have a website with a clear path to conversion. Linking to your driver or employee app is fine, but storing that data yourself is better. That, that is light years better. If it's a simple Google form right on your website or um, another third-party form, Gravity Forms, Ninja Forms, there are lots of different tools out there. Connect directly into WordPress. You can control that first-party data. If the person, uh, uh, I guess, qualifies under those initial qualifying factors, such as have you had a, you know, a federal offense in the last you know, 12 months, a question like that, if they pass those checks, then you can send them the real driver application because then that helps your recruiting department, that helps your AR, or not AR, but your HR department. And it just helps streamline a lot of, of the data collection. So you're not only collecting the data, but also making it actionable where it's, it's drivers that you actually, or employees too, that you actually want to work for your company. So make sure you have that clear path to conversion right on your website. Also using your website to reduce phone calls and answer as many questions as you can. You don't have to start huge with this. You can start small. You can start off with a few different pieces of paperwork that you know a lot of folks may request from you. A carrier packet is a great example of this. Um, but start small and make sure that you can build on it as you go. And talked earlier, WordPress is a great solution in order to do that at a cost-effective rate. Um, but keeping your website as a central place of communication for employees, for prospects, for, for drivers, um, customer notification, anything like that, any kind of prospecting or current employees, 
use your website as that central source, and then you can use social media in order to build that brand awareness so that when folks know about your company, they come to your website and there's a clear path for them to become a customer, um, to submit a quote, book a demo, all that good stuff. And then as I round out these last, this last tip is for a lot of one person marketing teams, skip the blog, go straight to social media. You're going to waste a lot of time on trying to wait for organic SEO to work. And it might not work for your brand. It might not work because you didn't format the article correctly. Uh, you didn't answer the right amount of questions. It wasn't 3000 words long. So my advice to the overwhelming majority of one person marketers is to skip the blog and go right to social media. If you can build awareness for what your company is doing, what you specialize in the problems that you're solving, you can build that awareness on social media. And then they come to your website and they convert when they are ready to buy. So skip the blog, focus on social media and focus on conversions on your website. And you will see a much higher return for the time that you have available. Because like I said, 90% of the carriers in this country, I have seven trucks or less. You're wearing a ton of hats. You don't have the luxury of a huge marketing department or an agency. And that's what a lot of these top, com these top 500 companies, they have access to that. A lot of companies do not. And this is how you need to make sure that you're building your brand awareness, and you're also converting that traffic into paying customers and into employees, drivers, all that good stuff. So hopefully you found that information insightful and helpful. We're going to be doing the same thing, the same analysis for 3PLs and for also freight tech companies in the coming weeks. So stay tuned for more episodes like that. But that is the top, I guess, insight for the from the top carriers in the United States. All right, let's segue to our first guest, our first and only guest for this show, because he is, is super impactful. He's a man of many titles, but most importantly, husband, father, freight creator, and CEO over at Rocket Shipping. Let's go ahead and welcome in Gabe. He's CEO of Rocket Shipping, as I just said. So welcome in, Gabe. Hey, thanks for having me, Bythe. Absolutely. Now, you know, in on. our pre-show document, you, you said that your name is Gaby, or is it Gabe? It's Gabe. I didn't know how to phonetically okay. spell Gabe, so it's, it's Gabe. Okay. okay, I just wanted to make sure. I was like, he said it said it was spelled Gaby, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be Gabe. So I just wanted to make sure that I'm not <laughs> mispronouncing your your name in this entire show. Yeah. For All right. Sure, so so sure. first question I got. Um, keeping the the website and social conversation going a little bit. How important is that to you guys over at at Rocket Shipping? You know, it's our main focus right now is creating content. Um, our website, we threw up right when we started the company two years ago, and we've really gone all in on social media since then. We are redesigning the website, but most of our customers and clients, their first, uh, you know, touch is a cold call or an email, but they go check us out on social, on LinkedIn, TikTok even, and they form an impression before they call us back or email us. And so, we want to be able to control that and, and try to control the narrative and push it towards where we're aiming. Love that. So, so for folks who who may not know, what is your sort of freight origin story? How did you get in into the world of freight? How did you found the company? All that good stuff. Um, pretty typical freight story. I did not aim to go into freight. I was working in college as an intern at a company called Unishippers, and mostly because I had gotten married and my wife told me I had to have a job, even though we were still in college. And that was a foreign concept to me, but I figured I would go find the first job I could that was on the bulletin board. Um, and I just, you know, started cold calling. It was like a hundred cold calls a day. And from there, I kind of branched off and, and ended up finishing my school, um, was going to be a chiropractor and decided to stick with freight. I, I found an affinity to sales progressed through that through another company and was a sales rep there. And then during COVID in 2020, I decided I'm going to go start rocket shipping, which our main purpose and our motto is to serve e-commerce companies that sell items that are too big and too bulky to ship UPS or FedEx ground and have to go LTL freight. Uh, there's a lot of complexities delivering to residences, whether it's white glove or just curbside. And so we went out to solve that problem. And I love that you brought that up because in our, in our pre-show document, you had also said that you love talking about the consumer delivery experience when it comes to LTL freight expectations versus reality. What's the most, I guess, misunderstood part of LTL shipping? 
Yeah, I call it the prime problem, uh, and I think you can know who that's referencing. But essentially, consumers expect if they're ordering something online that it's going to get there in two days, uh, whether that's a large sofa or just a book for their kid. Uh, they think it's going to be the same experience. Well, LTL Freight was never designed to deliver to residences. There's, you know, each terminal for a, even a major national carrier only has a few liftgate trucks, um, and so. Every residential delivery needs a lift gate, so everything's delayed. There's pretty poor communication for setting the appointments, and you know, on that topic, most people expect their packages to just get delivered while they're at work. LTL freight almost always, and it is evolving, but the way the market has gone is that you need a delivery appointment, and the best case scenario is that the freight carrier gives you a two-hour window. The worst case is that they say between eight and five, which is your working hours. You take a day off of work, and all too often, the freight carriers will you know, not be able to make that delivery even though they had an appointment. Customer or consumer has to call into the e-commerce company and yell and say, I took a day off at work. Where's my delivery? This is ridiculous. And, and that's what, you know, at Rocket Shipping, that's what we do is we manage that whole experience. We communicate with the customer uh, or the end user and we communicate with our client and, and the carrier and we kind of are the liaison for that. And so when we're talking about these kind of shipments, what are, I guess, what are the, some of the common, I guess, commodities that, that you're dealing with? Yeah, I think it, it ranges, but like the most popular would be furniture. Uh, so couches, desks, uh, during COVID, a lot of standing desks were ordered and we delivered a lot of desks to people's houses instead of at offices. Um, fire pits, grills, pool tables would be one that uh, is not as often, but that can't ship small package. Uh, anything that you can imagine you're ordering online that is more than, you know, 100 pounds and is probably more than 60 inches in length. Uh, even the mattresses that people are accustomed to delivering, most of the carriers don't want to deliver those anymore either uh, for UPS and FedEx ground. So it's, it's, it's a kind of a niche of home goods. And so when you're talking about, I guess, these home goods, like the first thing that sort of pops in my mind is that if I order something from Amazon or I order something from, um, I don't know, you know, Wayfair or something like that, they offer also like the white glove delivery aspect of it where they're going to come into yeah. your house and sort of set it up for you. Is that what you guys provide as well? Or how does that process work? Yeah. And oftentimes it, I'll, I'll walk you through Typically, the store, the client that we work with, we would provide curbside, but we also provide white glove. Now, white glove's pretty expensive, and as you know and everybody is aware, there's always free shipping in an e-commerce shopping cart, right? Because you don't want to add friction. You don't want to charge on top of what your discount is or what your product is. So white glove, almost no one offers free white glove shipping, and if they do, they've got massive leverage, and they have warehouses everywhere. But for your, your SMBs in the e-commerce, they offer curbside shipping for LTL. Um, unfortunately, and because of the consumer expectations for the delivery, it almost always is ordered, placed, picked up, and then the consumer goes, hey, I need this brought to the second floor of my apartment uh, or to the second floor of my house, or I need this inside, I'm not going to be home. And then we at Rocket Shipping, we will help our clients upgrade it to white glove. So we'll reroute the mm -hmm. shipment to a final mile facility and facilitate the white glove inside delivery. That makes a ton of sense. And I'm, I'm sure it's super helpful, especially if you're ordering like a huge piece of furniture and you're you have no idea how to get it up the stairs. I'm sure that's a that, that's a big issue that a lot of people yeah, would think pay for or a lot. <laughs> Yeah. And then I, another option is like, well, if it just arrives and then you are asking the driver to do this and the driver's like, I'm not doing that. I'm not paid to do all that. Yeah. I would think that, that that's a big uh, sort of uh, strain point for, for a lot of folks. Um, th there was a another topic that you mentioned in the show, Doc, because I'm just going to read here because I it's one, it's something that I've heard sort of echoing around the freight space, but I'd love for you to, to dive into it more. But you said that you're passionate about the major disconnect that we have in the freight tech space right now, because most of the TMS solutions and aggregators are being built and developed by people with no experience actually moving stuff, and that there are less than 10 SaaS companies in the space that are building tech intuitively with relevant freight experience. And you said there's a lot of innovation in the supply chain space, but a lot of it is way wasted effort, um, especially at the enterprise level adoption. So can you kind of break down of this, I guess, misconception of the freight tech space right now? Because I, it seems revolutionary, everything that's happening. But from what you're saying is it's almost like 
you kind of got to do a little bit more digging before you make that full commitment. Is, is that an accurate, I guess, assumption? Yeah. And I think, you know, where I, I made that comment was probably around the LTL space, uh, the truckload space. I don't know as much about, but in the LTL space, there's a lot of SaaS companies and TMS solutions that basically either are trying to serve uh, the brokerage. So they only are focused on how to manage markups and invoicing so that you can maximize profitability for a brokerage model, or they're focused on, you know, having a rebate from a freight carrier. So they're building it to be intuitive for that. I don't know of any really uh, impressive TMSs yet. And I think there's some being worked on that are focused on like consumer delivery experience and streamlining, you know, LTL, the final mile and actually improving that side of it. And since our economy, even before COVID, was heading towards more e-commerce than retail, um, you know, I think that the focus for these SaaS solutions needs to be on the end user and the client rather than the carrier or the broker. Yeah, because I, I, that, that's one common complaint that I hear is that with a lot of tech adoption is that the executives or the mid-management, they're making these decisions on what to buy without actually consulting with the employees that are going to have to actually use this software. Yeah. Do you have any, I guess, maybe any um, tips on, uh, is it just simply talking to your in-the-trenches employees on how to adopt software that's going to work for them? You know, I think another thing that I'll mention is that a lot of the best TMSs are built by corporations who move freight, but then they keep it exclusive to them, right? And so that's that's great for their company, but no one else can use it except for their customers. And so what I'm talking about is more the SaaS companies out of Silicon Valley that are building TMSs. They don't have any freight experience. They can code and they partner with carriers, or they partner with brands, but they've never moved a shipment. And so everything from the process of how you get a BOL to how you dispatch to a carrier is is not it's it's too clunky um, mm -hmm. because they're worried about markups and 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 managing multiple tariffs instead of you know it shouldn't take three clicks to get an LTL shipment it should be API uh, it, you don't need to build mm -hmm. a load you should be able to auto dispatch and so uh, a couple of the TMSs out there are building in really good logic using you know partners like Project Forty Four Banyan or, or or um, I think there's another one out there. I forgot the name, sorry. But they, they build in logic for dimensions and all the different rules and complexities for LTL, um, but they're not really white label platforms. And so that's where probably the disconnect is. Those that are white label platforms are building it for brokerages. Those that are really intuitive TMS platforms are owned by corporations and there's, there's a disconnect there. Hmm. And so I, it's obviously, it's a communication issue, which I, I think is the the sort of the the yeah. ever it's going to be the, the the same issue you know just different technology is if you don't have that line of communication there from the people who are actually going to be using these tools then there's the user experience is just going to uh dwindle and if people aren't actually using it then that's a lot of wasted money um what other as what other stories and freight are should be talked about more um, I think one of the other stories in freight that should be talked about more is, is generally speaking, consumer experience, because that's I'm biased to that. But, you know, I think probably, and there's a lot of hype and 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 talk about this with companies like Steam Logistics, but non-competes, non-solicits, and, and the industry being able to be mobile from company to company or start your own business. Uh, I think that's not talked enough about between, you know, how you can have these college kids come in and sign a non-compete, but they don't really know what they're signing and they're stuck with a company. If they want to move, they have to do it under the radar. They get intimidated. So there's a lot of that in this industry. I experienced it myself and I know others who have as well. So that's probably being talked about by Steam a lot, but not very many people besides them. Why do you think that more companies aren't talking about this? Is it simply because it's what they've done for so long or, or is it, I, I, I don't really know the reason, but I'd be curious to hear if you knew, if you had some insight into that. I think, I think that like most industries and, and probably even more than most industries is that a lot of freight sales and tech can be done remote and corporations are really worried that they'll lose their employees to either you know, outsourced sales like, um, you know, like sell X and you can kind of, you know, that's like an Uber for sales reps. Right. But they are also worried that, you know, even if they have a geography in Chicago doesn't matter anymore because a company like rocket shipping can hire them and have them work remote. And so I think that's what they're worried about. That's why it's not talked about. 
but it's going to change pretty soon here. And I think um, people are much more mobile and they can take their book of business with them a lot easier. And it also opens up. I mean, if you're a company and you are hiring, you, your talent pool opens up tremendously if you're not just looking in the geographic oh, yeah. area of, of where your company is. Um, but let, let's, let's I guess, transition into sort of that, that part of the conversation because you guys, from looking at your TikTok videos, you have a really cool office. Um, it, it looks like you guys all get along really well. How are you approaching, I guess, recruiting efforts when you're when you have this cool office, but then you also want to recruit from all over the country? How are you guys tackling that? Yeah, I think our main focus uh, with our TikTok is actually recruiting and saying, "Come work at Raga Shipping because this is a fun place to work." And I think you talked about it earlier in your show. Make it fun. Uh, we certainly put an emphasis on that, and we do have some also videos about what we do and and how we help clients and how we can help that supply chain for LTL. But when you're talking, you know, hiring in office versus remote, we do both. I have employees in. Chicago and in Florida and in Tennessee and I'm out of Fargo, North Dakota um, and I have Minneapolis and I think that that's kind of one of our superpowers is that I started rocket shipping during COVID so I had no option but to hire remote. I do think that it's the prison of two ideas. People are afraid of remote versus in office. I like both and I love being in the office. I work in the office every day in Fargo. Uh, it's a 20 minute drive but I come in every day and I've got a team here of 10 people. Um, but you can certainly expand and, and create, uh, the ability to go after top talent and attract it, um, from across the U S to work for a startup like rocket shipping. And that's a, that's a big advantage. So that's why we're using the TikTok to do that. How are you fostering, I guess, that community when you have a, a hybrid work approach? How, how, I guess, how do you feel or how are you involving, I guess, employees from other states making it still feel like they're, they're a part of the company? Is that a process that's evolving for you guys? Have you maybe got it figured out or, or still working on it? I don't think we have it figured out. It's always a work in progress, but it's my biggest thing is that like my role now, instead of just being the guy that brings on revenue, which is how I started it or helping on ops, my role now is to be the people person. And so not only am I trying to attract talent and interviewing people and bringing them here to, to meet our team, but I'm also next week, we're going to uh, um, Northern Minnesota for a, a summit for our sales team. And we're all going to go golfing for a couple of days and have some meetings and have some camaraderie. So We've got a guy coming from Chicago and from Tennessee and from Minneapolis all the way to the same spot. We did that in March. We did that in January. So it costs money. But I really think, uh, considering we have 25 people at our company, we're still a small company. I really think it's important that everybody feels part of the same vision and that there is a clear vision on where we're going. That's the other part is that everybody wants to feel like they're part of something and know where they're going and know how they can contribute to it. And so even if they're remote, we have standing meetings every day with ops and our sales and our marketing, and everybody knows where we're going and how we're trying to get there. So they still feel uh, in you know a huge part of it. I love that. That that's what I've heard from a, a couple other really successful companies that I follow is that they're fully remote, but they they put a really strong emphasis on uh, having the summits, having the 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 meetups, the retreats where they can go and they can mm -hmm. bond. Because I think for a lot of folks, when you're used to working in an office, there's always going to be people that just annoy the hell out of you. And so <laughs> when you have that sort of that that distance, that you don't have yeah. to work next to that annoying person that interrupts your workflow, but you could still, you know, go have a beer with them and, and play some golf with them. I think that that's a, a really good balance for the folks who want to get some serious work done, but also, you know, want to have some boundaries when it comes to living yeah. at work as well. Now, now you yeah. had mentioned about your your marketing department. What what does your marketing department look like? Is it? I know we've seen a, a couple of the funny videos. Maybe we can play one um, in the background of even one of that recently went viral with the social media girl. Let's play that clip. Yeah. <laughs> Is it gonna play? Okay. <laughs> Wasn't that just magnificent? I was worried it was getting a little dodgy in the mill part, but then that finale. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> no. Yeah, that one just that went viral, like 200,000 views. 
Yeah, it's crazy. And that, that, that's the, I, I keep preaching the power of TikTok, but you guys are really sort of that. That's how I found out about your company was through TikTok. Um, so how are you, I guess, structuring your marketing department and how are you, I guess, attacking social media? Is it really just like this, the, the social media? I hate calling her that because it, she, I'm sure she does so many other different things than just being the social media girl. But yeah. um, she's killing it, first of all. But second of all, how are you guys, I guess, approaching the marketing of rocket shipping? Yeah. And uh, to give her credit, her name is Elena Shellstead and she started with us in March. She's from the Fargo area. She's been incredible and she's really good at TikTok and a lot of other things in marketing. But our main approach actually is not just TikTok, not just LinkedIn. I'm trying to build personal brand on LinkedIn. I'm super focused on that, not selling rocket shipping, but really just trying to add value uh, about LTL and it's probably an overused phrase, but there's riches in the niches. And I'm trying to stay as niche as possible within transportation. So I talk a lot about LTL. We ship truckload, we ship white glove, we ship a lot of modes, but I talk about LTL because that's what I'm best at. And that's what I know. Um, but our approach to marketing and media in general is actually, you know, I'm giving a little bit too much away because I'm launching another company called Rocket Media uh, within rocket shipping, but I'm building out, I have a team of five now and all they're going to do is build out a media package for rocket shipping and then for others um, around content marketing, personal branding, and then also, you know, the traditional sales and marketing, which is having your video marketing and having your, you know, we use Vidyard and all of those techniques to, you know, make sales and, and land deals. So we I love that. So that's pretty much my main focus. I, I, so we're going to have to have you back on the show in the future to talk about Rocket Media because that just sounds like it, it's something that is sorely needed in this industry. Even looking at the top yeah. you know, carriers in the U.S., I'm like, God, some of this is just so just the same. It's And you guys are mm -hmm. really standing out by doing something different, something more modern. Um, so it, in addition to your social media approach, you're also, you know, making regular video content. You know, anybody who's watched your, your videos before knows the backdrop, knows, you know, the, the, the scenery that you're in yeah. right now. How are you approaching, I guess, sort of that video portion of the topics that, that you're covering? Are you coming up with the topic ideas yourself? Are you planning these out on a weekly basis? Walk me through how you're approaching that, I guess, sort of the industry insights part of your strategy. Yeah, I think that's pretty much leading back into the rocket media. That's why I've got those people and I've hired them and, and we're using it for that. Up until probably two, three weeks ago, I'd kind of been winging it. I just sit down and Elena is, again, a big help on that. She sets everything up. I walk into this studio, which is inside my office here. This is our conference room. Um, and I've always been able to just sit down. I do it unscripted. I just go for it. And then she edits it and cuts out every breath and makes it real smooth. Um, I learned that from Alex Hormazi. If you don't know who he is, you should. Um, and so that's what I'm doing. And then I keep a huge emphasis on, like you said, the same or consistency of brand. And so I always wear this hat. I don't always wear this hat outside of my videos. I do wear hats pretty often, but I always wear them for the videos. I always have the same background at the same conference table because if people are familiar with my brand, they will inherently trust it, even if it's maybe not deserved. So I still have to live up to that. But that's how I see media working. And that approach is, uh, I know that like Steve Jobs used to take that approach. Mark Zuckerberg is another one that takes that approach where they wear the same thing every day because as a leader, if they have to make one less decision a day, they want it to be, yeah. or that they have to make one more decision a day, they want it to be revenue based instead of, you know, what they're actually wearing. So I think that that's super smart to mm -hmm. kind of keep the same, you know, let the content speak for itself. And then, you know, it doesn't really matter, you know, what else you're wearing, as long as it's consistent with, with what viewers are used to seeing. Now, now, typically for to, to get started in content marketing, a, a CEO has to be convinced to do it, um, especially it's usually one person, the social media girl, yeah. which I have been uh, to try to convince the CEO to start doing content marketing. Was that the situation for you or were you the first to say, we got to start doing this? Um, no, I was, uh, this was my idea. I was the first one to come up with it. And then I started doing it last fall on my own. And then I realized that running a company of 20 people and doing this is very difficult. And for anybody who thinks, Oh, how does he spend that much time doing this? I don't, I have Elena, I have a social media team, but before that it was inconsistent and it wasn't effective. And so now I said, Hey, I want to do this. I'm going to go all in on it. 
Um, that's always kind of been my style is to, if I'm going to do something, I'm going all in. And so I hired a team and I put the expense on rocket shipping and said, it's going to be worth it. Uh, there's going to be an ROI and it'll make me efficient. And so, um, that that's the story of how that got started. So uh, speaking of ROI, how are you answering the, the ROI question? Are, are you getting clients from this? Are you getting employees? I, you said your TikTok strategy is mainly about recruiting, but what does that ROI yeah. look like for you? So TikTok is recruiting and that's been working and we've actually, you know, I'm on the show because of TikTok. Um, we had a couple of people already like they message us on TikTok and ask if we need carrier sales reps and, you know, we're building out truckloads. So we do. Um, but as far as ROI on LinkedIn, there's not a great tangible, I got a client because of this or like they watched one video and converted. However, I did put out a video two days ago. We're looking for help with a TMS solution and we have a great TMS. We're just trying to add on some services. And so I put out a video and I asked for some help. And within 15 minutes, I had four or five VPs or founders of TMS solutions talking to me, uh, whether it was a referral oh, wow. from somebody who watched my video or them reaching out themselves. And I've already had three meetings. So I see that as an ROI being connected. For sure. um, and then for LinkedIn recruiting top talent, that's certainly like some of the industry leaders probably know who I am, even though I'm not an industry leader. Right. And so you don't know very many CEOs. If I walk by the CEO of one of the top 10 carriers that you were talking about, I may not rec recognize them in the street. People may recognize me at a trade show because they've seen my videos. I don't know, but I'm certainly not an industry leader. It just appears that way from LinkedIn. And, and perception that you, is everything. You, exactly. You, you always have to manage, you know, sort of two different perceptions. The, the one that is reality and the one that is perceived. And, and you mm -hmm. are really killing it out here with a lot of this different content marketing. And so when you have these different segment ideas that you're coming up with, do you have... I guess, sources of, of what you're trying to, I guess, hit on? Or is it really just whatever comes to you, whatever you're, you're feeling for that day? Because I think a lot of CEOs yeah. and a lot of busy people, they get caught up with the nuances of planning, whereas yeah. they would just, I think, would be so much more beneficial if they just sat down at the microphone and talked about what's going on in their business this week. Is that sort of your approach? Yeah, yeah. You nailed it because uh, like yesterday's In the Weeds Wednesday, I was in the office. Elena is great about always having the camera like kind of ready to go and then we turn the light on. Um, and I was on a call with a client. We were solving a drop trailer. They had limited dock space. They only had four doors. And so we had to figure out which drop trailer, which carrier, and if we could live load with two others for LTL. And then I said, hey, Elena, let's go record in the weeds Wednesday about drop trailers. And so that's how I do all my content. I, I run the business and then I hear customer stories and I go, okay, this is how it relates to somebody else in LTL. And then I give a, instead of how to, I give a how I, and that's my mm -hmm. differentiator, I think. Love that. I think that that's where a lot of folks also mess up how you should do things. It's when in reality, it's you're just giving your own experience and people can pick and choose mm -hmm. what works best for them. I love that approach. I yeah. think, you know, we're, we're going to be seeing a lot more of your content over on LinkedIn, especially on TikTok. Um, any plans, any, any marketing plans in the future? Or is it just going to be a sort of a this is what's going on this week? And that's what we're going to talk about kind of strategy from you guys. Yeah, we're still startup mode with our, our main product, which is our LTL brokerage and our white glove solution. So I'm pretty buried in, in revenue producing activity. And my main goal right now is bringing on VP level executives and really trying to build this out from where we're at to where we're going. Um, so I'm still just taking the media strategy one step at a time. However, I think, uh, you know, if you keep an eye on the LinkedIn, I will be announcing some, um, some launches with Rocket Media and what we're going to do with that. So that's an exciting project. That's awesome. I can't wait to hear more about it. Where can folks follow more of your work, rocket shipping, all that good stuff? Yeah, I think LinkedIn and TikTok. And if you have the links for that or otherwise, if it's in the show notes, that would be where I would watch if I wanted to learn more about rocket shipping right now. Heck yeah. We got it all listed in the show notes. Make it easy for the lazy folks like myself. Uh, Gabe, appreciate your time. Uh, awesome perspective and really love what you're doing out here on social media. You are proving the blueprint of what I've been trying to tell these companies to take advantage of. So you're, you're out here killing it. So is the, is, is Elena, the so, AKA social media girl. Um, she had a video go viral the other day, which you can't really put a dollar amount on, um, that kind of exposure. I mean, you can technically, mm -hmm. but, um, you're going to be reaping yeah. the rewards of that one video for months, maybe years. Um, so congratulations on, on all the cool work and excited to, to see more coming out of you guys. 
Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Keep doing what you're doing. You're crushing it. Thank you. Likewise, you too. <laughs> Well, perfect. That was a, I mean, a really great interview to sort of kick things off um, with the, you know, I guess the couple months that we've had, you know, interviews going on. I like these more longer form interviews because we can really dive it deep into the nuances of these different discussions. So that's what I'm, I'm really hoping that we can provide more of in the future here on Cyberly. Um, but as we round out this show, I wanted to First of all, we got we to gotta tip the band here. And that's, I'm gonna stealing that phrase from Dooner over at What the Truck. And because we got to tip the band and say, want to boost your bottom line? Start with hiring the right talent. The Moon Air Group is the leading recruiting firm that specializes in identifying the top logistics and technology talent. Take the first step towards growing your business by visiting moonairgroup.com. Com. And we have a list of them or we have a link to them in the show notes. So if you wanted to, I guess if maybe if you were guessing on how to spell that, um, I had a tough time trying to spell it too, but now I got it on a lockdown. So the last topic that I wanted to, to round out th this week's show is the James Webb Telescope. Because it also, is speaking of Dooner, we're going to mention him again. Because shout out to Dooner for finding this picture of the telescope, the James Webb Telescope, that's made huge news this week, being shipped on a truck before it was launched back into space in December. And it's really that this entire week has just been so incredible to watch the the process of these images being released. Because I, I'm a I'm a big space nerd. I have been my whole life. Um, my mom had telescopes growing up as a kid. She just got a brand new telescope. Um, that, that's not really relevant to this story but it's it's an in, it's an exciting time to be able to see some of the images that we're now being able to see and if you notice on the screen this is the new deep field image you might remember you know years and years ago that the Hubble Space Telescope took this photo well now we have clear clear photos of that same image and now we can see the all of the nuances and all of the just the detail that's involved at this James Webb Telescope to put it in perspective, it's traveled a million miles in space and delivered those pictures to us this week. It sent the signal a million miles away for us to be able to see these images. And it took a global community of scientists and engineers 17 years to create this technology and to create this plan for the James Webb Telescope. So after traveling those million miles, they finally sent us the first image, which you just saw, and that's from deep space using infrared technology. So before, we were able to kind of just take regular pictures, if that makes sense. But with this new image, we're able to see the infrared, so the different sort of a, a light technology that we're able to see the all of the details of space. And so for the life on Earth, to put it in perspective, these images that we're seeing is about 14 billion years old. Earth life existing on earth has only been around for about 3.2 3.3 billion years if i'm right on that i know it's around 3 billion years i think it's maybe 3.6 billion years but life on earth as we kind of know it meaning like microscopic life not even like human life 3.6 billion years and this we're looking at photos from 14 billion years in the making it's just it's it's incredible and it's one visual that I do want to show, sorry for the podcast listeners, but one visual that I do want to show is that that photo that we keep seeing with all the galaxies and, and all of the different stars and things that are being formed in that one image, it is one speck of sand. It's say if you had one grain of sand in your hand and you held it up to the sky, that is what the James Webb telescope is looking at. If you're watching on the screen, you can kind of see what how vast this photo is of using the, this kind of imagery and this kind of technology. It's really, really incredible. And so as I sort of round out with, with this week's show, I do want to play this final video because it's one of my favorite creators breaking down the significance of these images. Let, let's play that video. More breaking space news. NASA just released the rest of the JWST first images. And I'm a little emotional about them. First up, we have the Southern Ring Nebula. Here it is. This is an incredibly detailed image of a star dying. When stars die, they expel their gases into space. And here's a photo of the exact same planetary nebula from Hubble. Look at the difference in detail. Not only that, but in a different infrared wavelength, you can actually see that the star at the center is a binary star. It has a twin. 
We knew it had a twin, but now we can see the twin. This is my favorite. This is the Carina Nebula. This is a stellar nursery, which means this is where stars are born, as opposed to the last photo, which is a star dying. Again, you're seeing the comparison. JWST actually photographed the outer edge, which is really cool. And we're seeing hundreds of stars that we didn't even know existed in this area. Look at this detail. All of those stars in this gas are just being born and they're gonna have planets and maybe life someday, I don't know. This deep field image was released yesterday, but for people who didn't understand why it was so crazy, there's the image from JWST compared to the same exact spot of space from Hubble. The difference is insane. Next up, we have Stefan's Quintet, which I am pleasantly surprised by because if you zoom into this galaxy, you can see single points of light. You can see individual stars in this galaxy. Aside from that resolution, another key difference between Hubble and JWST is with JWST, you can see all of the gas in those galaxies, which is so helpful in examining it for science purposes, especially if we want to study the black holes at the center of all of these galaxies. And finally, they released data about the atmospheric composition of the exoplanet called WASP-96b. And if you don't understand this chart, just trust me when I tell you that the detail and resolution with which they're able to capture these atmospheric elements is unheard of. They also confirmed that this exoplanet had water vapor in its atmosphere. I'm going to talk more about the science later, but for now, just appreciate this humbling and exciting to say the least of all of the different images that we've seen from from James Webb and we'll see in the future but I thought that little transportation note um what was a fun one to play off of a million miles and we're getting these images thanks everyone for tuning into this week's episode of Cyberly you can find all the replays over at Freightwaves TV or in your podcast app of choice you can follow me on everythingislogistics.com we'll see you right back here next week